Good evening, all. My name is Karen Carey, and I am the chancellor here at the University of Alaska Southeast. And welcome to Evening at Egan. Even though we are virtual tonight, we are hosted from Juneau. All of our campuses in Juneau, Ketchikan, and Sitka reside in Tlingit territory. Specifically, our Ak Lake campus in Juneau is located on the land of the Akwan people. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Akwan and the greater Tlingit community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. I also would like to ask you to join us on Monday. We have a number of events happening on Monday for Indigenous Peoples Day, both in Juneau, Ketchikan, and Sitka. And you can find out all about those events on our website at our uh, campus calendar. It is my great pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Dr. Wendy Smythe. Dr. Smythe is an assistant professor in American Indian Studies and Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Tonight, she will be speaking to us about the science in our stories, connection to place, belonging, and security for Native students in STEM education. I would love to have Wendy be a part of our faculty here in Juneau um, and become a member of our Southeast community. And I look forward to having that future conversation with her. So Dr. Smythe, will you please introduce yourself in your native language? Uh, yes, I will. Let me get my slides up here. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Hallo last at unterson die gudele lagen, die hadas hatai hatagen, sonat las tastes onai hatai udi ijum, kist akas gusturi a lagen. Die Klingwai Klakia Aigagen, Kstachloa Hinodekeon, Wendy Smythe Yatsakit Hinodekeon, Donna Douglas Di Al Uijung, Alec Ruth Douglas Di Chin Dinanu Ijung, Sam Elsie Douglas Di Chin Dinanu Ijung, James and Annie Di Chin Dinanu Ijung, Sunahut Kate Di Chin Dinanu Ijung, Hikta Handalai Stuth Ejun. Dean Carey. Thank you. And here is the English translation. I am of the Haida people. I am Sonneth Los Fisher House, Haida. I belong to the Eagle tribe. I am an observer of the world and a child of the ocean. My mother is Donna Douglas. My grandparents are Alec and Ruth Douglas. My great grandparents are Sam and Elsie. My great great grandparents are James and Annie. My great 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 grandparents are Chief Sunahut and Kate. My people are from Heidelberg, Alaska. Ha -ha. Welcome, Dr. Smythe. Ha -ha. Um, so I want to start by showing you my family. Um, on these two pictures on the top are um, four, three, and two generations back. Um, this is my mother and my sister and I. And I always like to start with this amazingly awkward picture of 13-year-old me, who never imagined um, the pathway that my life would take. 13-year-old um, me living in Heidelberg, sitting there playing Frogger with those amazing glasses and that awesome unicorn rainbow shirt, never imagined that she would be um, reclaiming part of her uh, culture and language and, and ceremony. Never imagined that she would be a geoscientist and an oceanographer. Never imagined that she would be an environmental activist and education activist for native people. And never knew that I would have the honor of mentoring the youth in our community. So I want to remind you as we go through this talk tonight that when, when I have these conversations, I'm not speaking to you as a scientist. I'm speaking to you as a Haida woman who have had experiences that I'm sharing with you tonight. And these experiences have impacted the way that I see and do science and bring science back to my home community. 
when we're engaging in this knowledge sharing together, we're in ceremony with one another. And I share this knowledge with you with respect and ask for the same respect when we start having questions and discussions. I'm not asking you to agree with what I say, but just to open your heart and mind and listen to, to my experiences. Uh, this is uh, my community. Um, I like to say that we are air, land, and water people because we are so connected um, to um, our, where we live. And we, we understand that what we do to the environment, it does back to us, especially as cultural and traditional use uh, community. Uh, my um, academic journey has taken me to work across three very distinctive sectors that I never imagined I would be uh, working in. One is a geoscientist, oceanographer. I look at um, iron and manganese groundwater ecosystems, and I'll talk about that briefly. I look at minerals that are made by bacteria, and I look at how nutrients in the water are recycled by bacteria and microorganisms. And that pathway took me into native education um, as I went along and, and some of my own obstacles that I stumbled across through academia, I started tying that back into uh, coupling traditional knowledge with science, tying in language and culture and developing curriculum from those experiences. And I also went into, um, have experience working in policy. I work with, uh, the I was at the National Science Foundation for two years working on diversity initiatives um, teaching program officers how to evaluate proposals focused on Indigenous people to make sure that they're funding proposals that are put together in consultation with tribal communities, of, of which often they're not, um, to make sure that they understood what tribal sovereignty was and tribal governments, what they look like, um, and made some diversity recommendations. I also work with NOAA, NASA, and the National Park Services and the National Institute of Health. Um, so I've been able to tie all this together and I kind of think of this and we'll do this tonight on a canoe journey through um, my academic career that led me into K-12 education and then into diversity efforts. So I'll tell you briefly about some of my, um, how I began in academia. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in molecular microbiology and was lucky to land in a lab that worked on astrobiology. And what is astrobiology? I didn't know, um, I had never heard of it, but it was exciting sounding. So I did some work in Yellowstone National Park. This is the hot spring that I've been working on for um, 15 years. And um, in Yellowstone, um, that is the largest hot spring area in the country. It's over a, a caldera, a volcanic caldera. And what we did is we would go in and take some of this rock that you see in this hot spring and look at it with high powered microscopes to see if we could see fossils there. And not large fossils, what you're used to looking at, but microscopic fossils that are extremely tiny. And that's what we find here. Um, these are uh, fossilized uh, cyanobacteria or algae. We can also see them growing on the rock. These are microorganisms growing and using the metals that are coming out of this groundwater um, for energy. And so I started there looking at fossils and then wanted to know who is growing there. So I went back into my uh, metagenomic um, DNA work and started sequencing these bacteria to see who was there and started growing them in the lab. And I um, discovered the first um, um, high temperature, so 100 degrees C. So if you think about room temperatures about 25 degrees C, 100 degrees C is extremely hot. Um, I found this organism. This is my baby right here. It looks like a loaf of bread. Um, it's a half a micron. It's extremely tiny, but this is the first known um, microorganism that can oxidize, so uses um, manganese, uh, a metal, for energy at high temperature, and it's an archaea. So it's not a bacteria. It's um, an older um, a domain of life, which we won't get into that tonight, but um, so I discovered this little guy and um, still work on it and we're characterizing um, how it's using manganese. But why were we doing this and how does this tie to astrobiology? Well, in the last few years, I'm sure you've heard a lot about Mars and the Mars rovers. But before that, there was a meteorite that landed in Antarctica and was found and they call it ALH 84001 or Allen Hills um, 84001. And when we find things like this, everybody wants a piece of it and wants to look at it with the same microscopes that we're imaging rocks from in Yellowstone. And they found this image. They found this little signature here. And there was lots of debate for decades as to was this a fossilized bacteria 
or was it made by chemistry? And there was vigorous debate for a long time um, about what this was. And if it was a bacteria, did it come from Mars? Because they know that this uh, meteorite came from Mars or did it come from Earth when it landed in Antarctica? So there's lots of debate about that. So the work that I do in Yellowstone, we look at fossils to say, if we find a fossil on another planet, what kind of environment would it be formed in and what would it look like? So we look at extreme environments to try to characterize what a microscopic bacterial fossil would look like. So if we ever find them on another planet, we would know what it looked like and be able to make some inferences of what that environment may have been like. So that's where I started. And then as I went into graduate school, I continued on this journey of looking at groundwater that had lots of iron and manganese, lots of metals in it, and was lucky to do um, some field research off the coast of Hawaii on the next island that's coming up called Luihi. Um, it's not, it's a thousand meters deep. It's, um, we will never see it in our lifetime. Um, but I got lucky to go out there and do some sampling and start looking at this environment as well. So I'm comparing now two groundwater ecosystems, both enriched in uh, metals, but very different environments. One's a hot spring environment, one's deep ocean. But I still compare them to see what is the similarities and differences between these systems. And then the four, third system that I look at is um, an hour and a half outside of my tribal community. Um, and I began working there. So it looks a lot like Luihi, but it's not a thousand meters deep, it's at the surface. And so we were started looking at this to say, what is the differences between these three environments, all groundwater, all enriched in metals, all hosting a microbial community distinctive to that environment. The difference with this environment is there's a lot of CO2 uh, carbon dioxide coming out of this ecosystem. So we can use this as a model, a natural model, a natural system to look at climate change and impacts on um, sea life. Um, so I began at this site connecting traditional knowledge to science. I'll, for a while, I was more looking at the science and in this colonized construct of what science was and not really using the traditional knowledge. And um, I talked to um, one of my elders and started asking about the history of this site that I was working at. And he told me, every time you go out there, you need to taste the water because it's called, we, it's called it's sweet water. And so I went to the site he told me about and I named, we named it sweet water and tasted the water. Well, as you can probably imagine, it was not sweet. It's enriched in metal, iron. And um, so I couldn't figure out for a while why he kept calling it sweet water, but I tasted it every time I went out there and we caught it on an El Nino and La Nina year these two different years. And one year there was a extremely high input of water uh, from rain precipitation and the water taste changed and it was reflected in the water chemistry. So now I can go out there, I've been doing this for uh, 14 years. I can go out and taste the water from this spring. And I know if our iron concentrations are gonna be high or low when we do our geochemistry. So that's why I first started tying in traditional knowledge into the science that I was doing. Um, on the top right corner here, uh, this is a, a mural that was done um, in San Diego um, on climate change impacts. And the artist interviewed four of us to, to construct this mural and it's called Fire and Ice. And so it's supposed to depict some of the work from Southeast Alaska. But as I went along this journey, of course, in academia, um, we start looking at issues of diversity. I started looking at issues of diversity for a variety of reasons. Um, because we realize uh, coming from a community of Heidelberg, a small community, and then coming from Ketchikan, uh, it's very different than going to school in Portland or Seattle. Um, the environment's very different. And there was no diversity in these spaces. And so I started looking at this and thinking about how it impacted my journey in academia. And it impacted it in a variety of ways. But what I started to realize as I moved through um, in my journey and started um, going through graduate school, realizing that diversity, and, if, and that's only not, not just racial and ethnic diversity, but discipline diversity, biology, chemistry, math. If we couple these together, we start to get increases in innovation, creativity, and productivity, which is what science is all about. We want innovation. We want to be the leading edge. We always hear these buzz terms when we come talk about science, because if we all think alike, we're not really gonna move forward. We're gonna stagnate and we're gonna slow down. Also tying these different disciplines and cultural ways of knowing together 
increases students' critical thinking skills. And I like to use this as a model. Um, if we have a cedar log, if you're given a cedar log and that's your hypothesis or your question or your problem, what are you gonna do with it? And typically I ask people, tell me what you would do with this. And I get answers like build a house, build furniture, build a deck, build a porch. We get the very similar answers. But if we say, I, I need to get from point A to B, how are those gonna help me? We need some innovation and we need to think about what are we gonna do with this? So what if we need a canoe and we build a canoe? Then we can, we can move forward and um, address the problem hypothesis or question that we have. We also look at academia in another way. Um, we always hear the promise of academia, right? Uh, we're gonna go get our education and we're gonna do X, Y, and Z and it's gonna be amazing and wonderful and it's different than high school and um, all this great stuff. And it can be there, it can be there, but it can also not be there. And a lot of times when we recruit diverse students, we don't recognize the needs of those students and the reality for them does not match up to the promise. And that can create more um, mental health issues because there's the feeling of despair, distress, and we end up with these very traumatic events happening for students who do not go into the system supported like they should be. When they're recruited and not retained, we need to quit talking about recruitment and talk about retention. So if we look at the obstacles in education, and then these are obstacles that I found as I went into um, academia and started my college journey of, can I be a scientist? Am I able to do this? Um, considering the environment going from Ketchikan to Portland, they're very different environments. And things that we don't think about are the stressors from those environments, the loud noises, right? Lots of cars, lots of people. We're not used to that in our environments that we grow up in and live in. That can be a stressor that most people don't deal with. Um, is there support from the community? Is there support from the family? Is there support within the um, school? Um, knowledge base, are our kids learning what they need to know to be successful if they choose to go into academia? We hear a lot about financial resources. If we don't know how to tap into those, they don't exist. And then the expectations of what am I expected to do in this space that I'm now occupying, the space of learning? What am I expected to do? And does my expectations match up to the reality? That's a stressor we don't think about. School resources, are they there? Do we know how to tap into them? And then the tokenism, it's everywhere and we have to be aware of that. Um, sometimes it's done um, innocently. People don't realize how they are um, tokenizing someone. So a lot of what I get, um, what well, I would used to get was, this is our native faculty. This is our native student. I do not allow people to own my identity. I own my identity. I can be a scientist in your department because when we introduce people um, by a racial identity, we're saying they're there because of that and not their scholarship. And that can be damaging without even meaning to cause damage. A lot of these obstacles are grounded in um, historical traumas. These traumas are alive and well in our communities. And what education means to my mom and to my grandmother is very different than what it means to me. I'm the first generation removed from boarding school and I did not have the experiences of those in my family. So to them, education is trauma and pain and fear and the loss of culture and language. To me, it's something very different. And we have to acknowledge that when we work with our native students and with our native communities, that trauma is there and we have to acknowledge it and we have to respect it. Looking at, um, if we compare um, knowledge systems as well, what we often hear uh, is traditional knowledge or holistic knowledge when it's described is with deficit language. And when we hear Western science, it is uh, described with asset-based languages. And there's no doubt they're very different knowledge systems, but there's an assumption that there's a hierarchy between these two knowledge systems and that does not exist. There is no hierarchy between these two. One is not better than the other. They're just different knowledge systems to distinctively different knowledge systems. But at the core, if you look at the overlap, have very similar methods and ways of um, acquiring knowledge. And if we teach our students two ways of looking at the world, 
we will increase not only there, but our own critical thinking skills, where we can look at a situation and a problem and address it in a very different way, in a more productive way. So if we consider the intersections for student security. So if we look at uh, place, identity, and belonging, and how do we create a student that is secure in the space that they choose to occupy? Because when they come into our classrooms, when they go into academia, when they go into school, well, when they're in K-12, they don't choose to go there. They have to go there. But when they come into academia, they're choosing to be there. And how do we create a space that they are secure in? So one of the things we can think about, and I do a lot of field-based research and taking students out. And so one of the things I think about is place. Uh, when we go do field research, what does that place mean to what to my students? But to keep in mind that places have different meanings to various groups of people. And just because we have no connection to that space does not mean that our student won't have a connection. So I have two images here. Um, one is from Kassan, Alaska. And the other one is uh, Mount Vernon in Virginia. This is the home of George Washington. And there's a lot of field trips there, high school and, and college undergraduate field trips. And when you go there, you watch a film and people, there's thousands of people that visit this space um, every year. But do we ever step back and think about what does this place mean to indigenous people who look at this as a place of dispossession, loss of culture, loss of life? What does this place mean to people who were enslaved on this land, who were tortured and locked up? had no free will whatsoever. This is not a place to celebrate for them. So we have to think about what do these spaces that we take our students into, how does it impact them? But we can also make it a positive. If we go to a space and we're gonna do our field research and we talk about the history of that place because that history also informs our science. If we find some anomaly there, was it because the people that occupied that land before did they impact that land? Did they impact the water chemistry? Did they impact the soil chemistry? Did they impact the plants? Likely they did. And so if we know that history, that can inform our science. If we acknowledge the land that we're taking students on, just a simple acknowledgement can make all the difference in the world for a student. Looking at identity, one uh, uh, part of my introduction is I say um, that I'm an indigenous scientist and I do that because I, I've had my own struggle and I talk to a lot of students who struggle with this identity. Do I be an academic here and hide my indigenous self? And do I be indigenous here and hide my um, science self? Because people don't understand it and feel intimidated by it or just don't like it. How, how do I be an authentic person? And we cannot be two people. We have to be a whole person because it literally rips us apart and it becomes um, a source of, of, of pain and trauma. So we have to merge that into a whole person. So now I introduce myself in my introduction as an observer of the world or as an, a Haida scientist. So do we allow our students to have that identity and do we support that identity even if we don't understand it? And belonging. A lot of students that I work with talk about how they don't feel like they belong um, in, in the classroom, in the science, in the discipline. Um, when they do internships, they talk about having this feeling that they don't belong there. And when you ask them why, they often say they don't see themselves reflected. They don't see someone that looks like them. Um, they don't see any imagery indicating what land they're on or that if, if they're in their own area, uh, tribal territories, they don't see any of that reflected. They're made to feel like they don't belong there by comments that are made or something that's said to them. And also they see imagery that can be of mascots and some derogatory imagery. And one of the things I try to remind my students of when we have these discussions is look at a map. If we look at these maps, one on the right is a language map of Alaska. The one on the left is the cultural regions of the United States, continental United States. If we look at that, what we see is that we are always on native land. And so I remind my students of that, remember whose land you're on and know that you belong where you are. You were guided to be there and you, you need to occupy this space. There's a reason you're there, it's not by accident. So know you belong. And that usually makes, um, can change how students view their sense of belonging. So if they have, a, they have a connection to place, a strong sense of identity and a feeling of belonging, now we've created this ability to retain our students in these disciplines because they have a sense of security.
But when we also talk about security, we have to talk about safety. Um, this map is from the Southern Poverty Law Center. It is a hate map of the United States. So when we take students out, those white dots show registered hate groups in this country. We have to know where we're taking our students to do field work or on field trips. We have to know that their, their safety, because um, we're responsible for that, not only theirs, but um, we have to make sure if we drop them off to do field work, that we're gonna come back and they're gonna be okay. So that's another thing that we have to start thinking about and, and how do we make sure that they navigate through um, their field research without um, encountering someone who is going to um, harm them. So tying all of that together, thinking about traditional knowledge systems, identity, belonging, um, how do I translate that into an Alaska Native education program? And so this is something I've been doing for 14 years um, in my own tribal community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that now. So one of the things that we had to do is I had to think about how to reimagine science education. What is working? What is not working? And what we see a lot of the time is what I call the hit and run approach. Uh, so if we look at the individual on the top of this pyramid, there's, there's um, high achieving students, very excited about what they're doing, and they often get recruited, and sometimes they get retained, and sometimes they don't. And they can be um, leave the system because of any number of obstacles that are there, lack of support, lack of um, sense of belonging, any of that can play come into play. And when they don't succeed in this colonized construct, what happens to them? We often don't track those students. And those are the ones I'm interested in because what we see is um, an increase in suicides from students who don't make it in these systems that they're recruited into. Um, and that impacts an entire community. Um, we see addictive behaviors, we see mental health is, um, issues, and those should not be happening because of um, us recruiting students into academia. So how do we go about this a different way? When I went in, I worked for two years with our elders and asking them to share their experiences and their ideas of education and what it should be in our community. And um, what do you need? What do you want us to do? How do we do it? What do you want us to do? And so I worked with them for two years and then started working with the tribe and then working with the school. And so we went in and we started taking students out um, to work in the rivers. So we did some assessment of, of four rivers and of the co coastal ecosystem. But we also tied the community in every step of the way. Um, we started doing um, science fairs in 2011. And we not only had students do science projects and show uh, what they were doing, I would bring up indigenous scientists, um, undergraduate students, graduate students to come up and show their science and do hands on activities. But we also had linguists come in, people who spoke Haida. We had cultural practitioners come in and we had environmental uh, planners from the community come in because all of this is science, right? We're, the Western part of it and the traditional knowledge part of it is all science. So we had all of it there um, to model that for our students to show that both of these systems are relevant in this space. But I also worked with a lot of mentors um, and we provided internships across several different universities, also with the tribe. We brought students who did science projects throughout the year to a national science conference. That's to give them a step out of the community um, for four or five days into a space that would be very foreign and unfamiliar to them. And then they go back home and they can unpack that, the sounds, the activity, the planes, the trains, the cars, the loud voices, things that they're not exposed to every day, they get to unpack that in a safe space. And then they go back to the conference next year. And it makes a difference for retain, retaining students in academia. Uh, we had 12 native mentors and a total of 13 uh, researchers come up, 18 students, and in the last couple of years, um, because I was at the National Science Foundation, I started bringing program officers up because they need to see what our communities are. They don't know. They only know what they see in mainstream media. And that's often not reflective of who we really are. We also did um, worked in intertribal collaboration. So I've worked with many different nations, bringing students up from these nations who want to do the same work in their community to show them how we're doing this work and for them to share their language and culture and their protocols with our students as well. So doing this cross-cultural now knowledge exchange, we all have water, we all have different beliefs on water and we can share that knowledge uh, with one another. 
So we started tying this into um, curriculum development with the objective of creating culturally aligned science education uh, program for K-12 students. So now that they're seeing culture, language uh, reflected in their science curriculum, but also giving the teachers the background. So in the K-12 space, most of our teachers, if not all, are not from our community. So if they don't know who we are, they don't know who our students are, they don't know the culture, and they don't know the worldview of our students, they're not going to be able to effectively teach them. So we started developing curriculum tying in traditional stories um, so that they can start using that to teach our students. And oftentimes these teachers are alienated and we need to start embracing them and we need to teach them who we are. If we're not gonna grow our own students in our communities, we need to embrace those that come in so that they can teach our students using our language and our worldview so that our students can connect with science and uh, feel like they belong in that space. So we made this nested approach to developing curriculum, starting with culture, um, traditional stories, language, um, consultation with the community and elders of, are we doing this the right way? Is it okay to do this this way? And then we did all the science um, in place. So we would go out to rivers, we would go out into the forest, we'd go down to the beach and talk about climate change and impacts. If the tides got higher, what part of our coastline would disappear? So we would go out and do these different experiments and uh, mental experiments out in the field. An example of how we tied culture into the curriculum, we, we were considering two views of one world. So I don't know how many you, of you have taught chemistry, but when you teach high school students chemistry and you start talking about hydrogen ions and pH and acids and bases, typically what you get is a student falling asleep on you because they don't connect to it. And so what, did, what can we do to connect our students? And so I started using basketry, um, specifically spruce roots. And so we asked students, what is this? And they'll say, it's a spruce root basket. Well, how do you make this? And they start telling us the type of uh, plants we need to get. Where are they going to grow? When do they grow? When do we harvest the spruce roots? What type of soil is it in? Um, if the soil is acidic, and now we are, now we're at chemistry, uh, this roots, the, the roots will be stringy and we can't weave. So then we take each part of what that student told us and we tie um, biology chemistry, geology, when we talk about the soil, algebra for weaving, we start tying it and connecting it to what they know, because that's how we all learn. If we can connect to it, we understand why we're learning it. So we started tying it to cultural and traditional use practices within the community. And we started developing curriculum for the teachers. Uh, one example in the middle is we used um, totem poles. So um, Heidelberg uh, redid all the totem poles. So we were able to take pictures of the bottom of the old poles and the new poles and started constructing a four or 500 year history of the region from tree rings. So looking at dendrochronology to look at the climate history of space, which was of, of the space where those trees were harvested, which was really interesting to be able to do. We took a creation story and started doing um, anatomy and physiology which I'll show you on the next slide. And then we started teaching evolution from that too. So as the students went through 11th and 12th grade, they were getting that story um, and, and we we're adding a different part of science to it each year. So they're using the same story, but every year they go through school, there's something different added to it. So one of the experiments the students did was coastal bioassessment using shipworms. And I'm sure you've seen uh, the wood on the beach uh, with these the boreholes in there with the white lining that's from a shipworm. Um, it is a relative to a clam. Um, they have a, a divergent evolutionary event happen though, and they have very different shell morphologies. Um, they have very very different body plans, but they're they're related. And in, um, so we started taking those, and the students started dissecting them. But we also used it to assess the environmental quality of our coastal. Um, ecosystem, specifically at the dock um, in, in Heidelberg. And uh, when we started, the picture on the bottom left is where we could see trash bags in the water and there's oil on the surface. And so we thought, well, let's see what's going on here. Uh, maybe there's nothing going on. Let's see. So we had the students take wood and construct these what we call traps and they drop them in the water. And so what we assume is once the water we put an anchor on them and they fall straight down. And so they sit vertically in the water column. And so in oceanography, we talk a lot about just a water column. Well, we pretend that that column is not moving, even though we know water is flowing through it. 
So we have a vertical section now with a trap sitting in there and we're gonna see, um, what we wanna see is shipworm colonization. Shipworms are sensitive to uh, environmental pollutants and contaminants. So what we got, uh, we, we left it in there for a year because it's cold water, they grow much slower than in subtropical regions. Most shipworm work is done in subtropical regions because they grow fast, but not here. And we also couldn't have student sampling and pulling these out in the winter. It's too dangerous with the, the bad weather. So we pulled it up a year later. And what we can see, um, I hope you can tell um, that the top three traps have a lot of material on there. There's sea squirts, there's sponges, um, there's lots of algae on there. And then the bottom two don't have too much going on. And that's what we wanna see. Shipworms make a chemical that keep other things from growing on the wood because they need access to the water because they have a, a siphon that sticks out and they filter feed. So they need to be able to not have other things growing on top of them, which this is very strange to find. So what we see is between nine and 12 meters, something is going on. Um, this top layer is indicating that there's a pollutant and a contamination happening. And what we know um, at that time is that when people would swim in this area, they would get rashes on their body. So we knew something was going on. And we did this for five years. And um, every year we'd throw in the traps um, with the fifth grade students, fifth and sixth grade, and then the high school students would pull the traps out and do anatomy and physiology and, um, and then do some of the environmental assessment. And we would generate a, a, a data set. And after five years, we put it together in a report and we gave it to the tribe. So all this work is being done in conjunction with the tribe. They know we're doing the research with the students and uh, we take that research and give it back to the tribe. And that data was able to be tied into a, um, a grant that allowed the tribe to uh, secure a grant to clean up the marina. So they ended up removing four tons of um, marine debris, batteries, nets, buoys, sunken uh, fishing vessels. I um, believe there was refrigerators and all kinds of stuff down there that was all pulled out and a new dock was built. And so um, some of the work the students did were able to help make this happen. And so I asked the students, um, do you wanna keep doing the assessment or do you think it'll be fine? Well, of course they wanted to keep doing the assessment. They've been doing it for five years. They wanted to keep doing it. And what we found um, after one year of this um, uh, uh, remediation and building of the new dock is that we had um, growth of shipworms along the entire water column. So whatever was impacting um, the environmental health of that top 10 meters of water had been remediated. And we don't know what it was exactly, um, but whatever it was, was removed from that space. And so this is part of where the students were able to do a research project that had a direct community impact. So now if we get to the science in our stories, as we move along this journey across 14 years of this program, we started building onto it each time. And so this last year, uh, we, we started taking um, traditional stories and deconstructing them and deconstructing them into science lessons or what is that story telling us? What we know is that words were chosen with intention and stories were put together to relay knowledge to another generation. And that was done with intention. So if we look at um, the main character in our story, uh, Raven, uh, we know that he has many forms and um, it can be a trickster, is believed to be a complex reflection of our own self. He can transform and be a creative force, but is always a central um, cultural hero. He is responsible for creating Haida Gwaii, uh, releasing the sun from a box and making the moon and stars. And when we look at some of the stories of Raven, um, he brought us fresh water, salmon and a house for humans. So I'm gonna let you listen to a story uh, recorded. Um, it, the uh, text is in Haida. And I'll let you listen to that. And then I'll translate that on the next slide. And we'll talk about deconstructing this into science lessons. Quayaista in Sudayani. Wagen l Quayaelan. Wagen Hornelani. Wagen good hardl Pladani. 
wagen gut hansla hasto gayan askai qoyayu gudayan wagen in guskai tlau kwandayan askai qoyayu gudayan su qoya ikhjuga out su gayal khishki dayan wagen hausen stal qaydan Hold Nasen Katlagan. Wagen Hodai Pant the Ayan. Wagen Wakunast Gum Pant Kay and Gangan. Wagen Handlai Langa Hutliai Ugudingana. Wagen Hodai Lak Anga Kuyat Gangan. Jinga Langa Hutliai Ugudana. Wagen last sen kaidan hand lai la hut kait giga naista. Aji hand lai kadet zidlo des kat o kades tlaganan. La kades lastlo gawan kwayan jing angendan kalani. As dias o good naisti gani. Wagen hausen wat o la kades laya. Wadlu kwashkistet lagan, as jigaisen galan. Wadlu hausen wat elk hagwail kodas layan. Elk odas lasi kathlian gut lal gikuskadan. Wagen lal plus kais wanelan. Wagen tlan kwah kalan. Gut lal gikuskadan su. Hand Wadluan gum elgen angen, sin Wadluan qua young seek anana. Gum oops, you don't hear that again. Okay, so this is a traditional story that was recorded in the winter and spring of 1900 uh, by John R. Swanton, who is an American anthropologist and linguist. Um, he recorded this when he visited um, the Haida village of Masid. Uh, on the northern coast of Haida Gwaii in three Haida villages in Southeast Alaska. So the story uh, and the translation is blocky because it's hard to translate word for word across from Haida to English. So this is the translation. Um, the person who spoke this is Ryan Kessler and he translated it from one orthography to the one that you saw and then from that orthography to English working with some of our um, young linguists um, from Heidelberg. So the story is not long ago no land was to be seen. There was a little thing on the ocean. All water was from the sea and Raven sat upon it. And Raven said, become dust and everything became earth. He divided earth and put it into the ocean on each side of him. The piece of earth he was on was small and the rest of the earth was large. And Raven was off again. When he went to where Eagle lived and saw that Eagle owned fresh water, Raven had no water. He only had sea water and he wanted to drink the water of Eagle. However, Eagle did not want to give his water to Raven. For a long time, Raven wanted the water to drink, but Eagle refused. So Raven went to the owner of fresh water, Eagle, and, and drank the water in secret, and he went off with the stolen water. After Raven had taken the water, he carried it in his bill, and he let a drop fall, first to make the Chilkat River. When Raven spit it out, all the water soon flowed away. The ground became dry and his mind was sick on account of this. He then spit out more and that too flowed down and dried up. At that time, he let still more drop. And as soon as he had let it drop, he bent it together and made a circle out of it. Then it stopped running off because he bent it together. All streams keep on running, although they run every day. Now there's a lot in here that's super exciting. Um, the story begins with the phrase, not long ago. This is intended to be facetious. Uh, the rhetorical style of the Haida are to say the opposite of what is intended. And there's no way to know or understand this unless you spend time with the community. So it's important when using traditional knowledge to work with the community and get an understanding of what the proper meaning making is supposed to be for that knowledge system. The telling of bending of the water refers to a process, the water cycle, a natural phenomenon and relays how the storyteller perceives the world. We all hear about the water cycle 
in K-12 education as well as in academia. It's a transfer of energy around the planet. We see uh, here uh, when he talks about um, his mind was sick on account of the water drying up could refer to cycles of um, um, when there was no rain. So if we look at this, um, look at the geology and geography in the water story. Um, for the context of the story, it originated um, from Haida residing on Haida Gwaii, which is this island down here. Um, it's an archipelago off the northern Pacific coast of Canada. And from the perspective of someone who had never left Haida Gwaii, it would seem that only the ocean existed. Those that traveled the ocean and returned to Haida Gwaii likely told stories of other land masses, larger land masses. And this knowledge is explained in the story through the discussion of he divided earth, discussing distinctive land masses. And the reference to the size of the land masses, the piece he was on was small and the rest of the earth was large. This may refer to the small size of Haida Gwaii relative to the large land masses of the North American continent to the east. So if we start pulling apart different parts of this story and saying, what are they talking about? We see that hundreds of years ago, there was an understanding of geology and geography of water, um, the difference in fresh and salt water. Um, we can pull some of these different pieces out and teach um, science from these stories, which I think is a really interesting and very um, telling that the importance of traditional knowledge and how much knowledge it held hundreds of years ago. Um, let's see, my slides freeze a little, there we go. Okay, so if we look at uh, multiple ways of knowing and how we merge these fields together, um, if we look at traditional knowledge as a sphere, and I like to use this woven cedar pattern because if each plate or each piece of this uh, pattern is math, chemistry, science, different science disciplines, um, spirituality, social science, um, it's all in one, it's all encompassing and it's understood to mean all these different things when we talk about them. When our students have this understanding, they have that one way of viewing the world. And when they go into school or they go into academia, it's presented in a very different way. And it can be really hard to flip between these two knowledge systems if we're not familiar with them. So what we see when they, we go into academia is um, knowledge systems are very compartmentalized. Um, and pure sciences we hear about a lot. But we know that other um, disciplines impact, they all impact one another. So what if we teach our students both systems together? That again, as I said earlier, increases critical thinking skills and gives them two ways of viewing the world. And when they move between spaces, they can think differently. They, they're able to use this compartmentalized way of thinking for some things, and then they can use a holistic way of viewing the world for others. But this isn't the end of this model, because what we have to be able to do is link all these disciplines together. We note that the arrows are bi-directional because different experiences and different disciplines inform how we view what we're working on and what we're learning about. But we also have to link traditional knowledge to these knowledge systems as well and have a bi-directional arrow as well. So if we think of it that way and we go back to this circle of water, um, bending the water, we hear a lot about the water cycle, we can reimagine science teaching, instead of just teaching condensation, precipitation, evaporation, we can start tying in salmon cycles and spawning cycles and how these this water cycle impacts our environment. But there are a few things that come into play here. Um, when we're using traditional knowledge systems, one is respect for the intellectual property and the ownership of that knowledge system. The acknowledgement that it was created and discovered tens of thousands of years ago and is still relevant today. And also that the cultural ways of knowing are important and meaning making is very important and interpretation of that knowledge and doing it the right way is important. It cannot be redefined through a different lens. So the, the work I've been doing um, has presented several different ways of engaging students in science learning opportunities. From science fairs, we had a student build a three-dimensional model of our watershed and show what logging would do on our river, um, on the Heidelberg River, um, if it was ever logged. Um, we do place-based science. We allow opportunities or provide opportunities for students to go to conferences, uh, provide internships and research opportunities for students either in the community or outside the community. 
um, we prov provide uh, cross-discipline science learning. Um, if a student wants to learn something that I don't particularly do, I will find someone to bring there to show them and to talk to them about that discipline. Uh, the science is inquiry-based and place-based and culturally aligned. We use traditional plants. We talk about um, nutrients and um, human health and how the environment impacts our food resources and how that in turn impacts us. And so we know it's all a cycle. In the beginning, I said we're air, land, and water people, and we know what we do to the land, it does to us because we have a close relationship with it because that is where our, our cultural and traditional use and subsistence resources come from. So we had a um, community change from this over 10 years. Um, when I first went in, I asked the students, I asked 70 students um, to do an exercise for me. I asked them to close their eyes and try to clear their mind. And I'm gonna say a word. And as soon as I say the word, write three words down. And it was amazing that 70 students came up with the same seven words. And this is a word cloud. And on, in a word cloud, the biggest word is the word that is said the most. And the smallest word is the word said the least, okay? Of those 70 students, 60% were female. And if you look at this, and this is the description these students had of a scientist. White was the first word. Male was the second. None of our females identified as a scientist or even being able to be a scientist. And then um, lab coat, glasses, bald, crazy hair, old. Um, that is what um, we got. And I realized right away that I had failed these students because in the beginning, I had focused on bringing non-natives into the community because I wanted them to see who we were and I wanted them to be able to work with their students that came into their classrooms um, in an authentic way. But what I didn't do is address the needs of our students in the classroom in Heidelberg. So I started working with um, and recruiting um, indigenous science students from around the country and particularly females in engineering, oceanography, biology, um, botany, um, different fields um, brought them up, education and medicine. And we asked the question again, um, a year later after bringing these um, female scientists up and we got a very different word cloud, a very different response. Um, they changed the main word to smart. And then what we see now is male and female are identified as being able to be a scientist. We also see words such as respectful. So Yachtan, one of our core cultural values is respect. They tied that in and said, that is what it is to be a scientist. Native is now in here. So now a native person can be a scientist. And so if we focus on these bigger words that they say, we start seeing some really interesting trends, but the most important words are those words said only once or twice. And those words are personal descriptors. A student talked about their hair texture, their height, um, tall, short, curly hair. That is a student personally identifying now as being able to be a scientist or as being a scientist. And that is a foundational change in that student's identity, which is really important and beautiful to see, very um, exciting to see. But we cannot only focus on our communities because our students don't just stay in our communities. Um, let's see if my slide's gonna change. There we go. Um, some of the work now I do um, translates outside of the community. Um, I work in academia. I do uh, national training for faculty to be able to engage with tribal nations and their students in a respectful, ethical way. And how to um, foster those students being safe and secure to use their traditional knowledge in class. I also work with a lot of funding and federal agencies, um, again, to how do they engage with with researchers wanting to work in native communities because there's a very big difference between working with us and working on us. And I um, wanna make sure that what is funded is with us, not on us. That time is gone. Um, I also do a lot of work in um, anti-racism in science, um, part of the No Time for Silence movement. Um, this came about after um, George Floyd. And there's a, uh, we work with federal agencies, universities and industry as well.
So some institutional considerations. Um, there's a lot of questions we can ask ourselves when working in diversity and trying to work with our students and with communities, but there's a couple really important ones that we can remember. One is that this type of work, diversity work, engaging with tribal nations, engaging with native students is lifelong learning. We will not take one class and one workshop and know how to do this. It takes time. And if you're not willing to commit to it, then don't do it because it's lifelong learning. We're, we're learning who we are and you're learning with us. And to change traditional knowledge systems in different ways of knowing to asset-based language because it increases critical thinking skills for not only us, but our students. And with that, I will say how, uh, and I wanna acknowledge the people who have been key um, in this journey with me, um, the elders who advise me and the community members who have supported and um, um, supported the work that I've done um, all along uh, this pathway that I have been on. And with that, I will say how a dung log and um, if there's any questions or discussion, I'm happy to, to engage in conversation. Thank you so much. For those of you who have questions, I would just encourage you to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Uh, I just wanted to say how uh, um, my dad, Reggie Nathan, um, is from Heidelberg, so it always makes my heart happy to see um, work being done in, in the hometown. How uh, Hi, I'm Sonny. I'm from Oak Bay, so welcome. And uh, I like what you said about having it work with us and not about us. I read recently an article about the bark from the yew tree and how it was gathered and that information was shared. And today, of course, they make taxmo. I think that's what it's called. I may be saying it wrong, but and that's the best cure for cancers. And that medicine originally came from Haida. And it was a gentleman who was walking with a Forest Service gentleman and showing him how to reduce the swelling on his arm. So mm -hmm. I'm really glad to hear that part. And I really enjoyed your talk. Goodness, Chief, thank you. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, the um, shipworm study also, there's an interesting part to that. Um, there's bacteria that live in the gills of the shipworm. And it has anti-cancer properties. So some of that work is being done with um, another university to um, that they work in the subtropical regions and they have never used cold water um, shipworms before. But um, we will eventually get there. Right now we're doing environmental assessment with um, those animals, but hopefully soon we'll be able to do some of the um, microbiology on that in the classroom. Any other questions, comments? I know it was long, sorry. <laughs> well, go ahead. No, goodness, Chief. I just wanted to say how inspired and excited I am to see the work that you're doing. I'm um, a cultural specialist at Glacier Valley Elementary School, Sit Itishanach, and just recently I was asked to share some stories. Uh, well, they're talking about natural disasters, and they're like, "Oh, if you know anything, maybe you can give us translations." I was like, uh, "Our kids deserve more than that, though." So, and just in the studying, I, I found some like Dua Latuya Bay. Uh, there was a story about Kosh Dua, and um, basically we just we heard the story, and the kids were were of course mesmerized by the story. But I was like, hey, that's science. That's they studied um, the glaciers falling off and cliffs falling, and that created a tsunami, mm -hmm. and that information was passed on through the stories. And I was explaining to the students, it's like, well, scientists today we study, or they study, and then they they go to a board and they publish, you know, something, or they confirm it, and then they publish it. But Shingit a long time ago didn't do that. You know, we didn't have paper to publish and that wasn't the intent it was passed on through cultural knowledge and I just I honestly I just made the connection myself this week so I've been really I want to say geeked really excited um, to be able to share that and there's been a few examples I think um, I think so I brought in the the story of uh, the creation of uh, Killawil and people are like wow the kids are like that is that really how it came to be and I was like no that's the study of the the nature of the creature it's like you know we 
they can get people or scientists just like today where they go out and study a bird and we did the same thing we studied killer whales and the story talks about how violent that creature can be and um and then of course in the end they say you'll never harm another human being it's like they studied that it, they noticed that it's it's been violent to other other creatures but never to humans and that's how the information was passed on so i was and i also got to bring a TikTok video into the class and the kids were really excited so i just like in hearing your presentation i was like who is she i want to know her i want to know more so i just right. want to say good you, know, you see uh, posture changes in students too right when you start talking about science what we noticed is that they would they would hunch over i don't you know trying to be small I don't know anything. I'm dumb. And they would say, I'm like, no, absolutely not. You're eight years old and you hunt. I know, you know, things you could survive better than me in the forest. So please. Um, so I would say, well, where do you fish? And they would tell me where they would fish and when they would fish. And I say, okay, let's talk about that. There's, there's, you know, um, biology in there for spawning and, um, ocean science in there and environmental science. And then you start seeing this change in posture where they're sitting up now and they're proud and they're like, Oh, cause now they're making the connection because it's such part of our life. We don't recognize it as science. And, and so we see it so disconnected because the way we're teaching is not tying in the worldview that they have. And when we can couple those together, we see a completely transformed student and it's beautiful to see. And it's amazing to see, um, but you, you do see that posture change too, of how they sit up and how they, they move in class. Um, it was really, really cool to see that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? I just want to say thank you, Wendy. This was just amazing. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to meet with us. And I look forward to further conversations with you. Um, your work is just incredible. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Well, thank you all for hanging in there with me. It's 10 o'clock for me or 11 o'clock for me. So, <laughs> um, but thank you so much. And um, if anyone has any questions, you can always um, email me. Um, I'd be happy to send resources or whatever I can to you. Um, if you're tying this into your own classroom, I'd be happy to send you whatever I have. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, yeah, okay. well, how, uh, Wendy, could you put your um, email address in the chat for us? Oh, yes. So, Good to change how. Uh, Good night, Wendy. Thank you so much. Good night. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Welcome. King. Thank you so much. Have a good night.